Kia ora, I'm Claire Finlayson, Programme Director of the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival. The 2019 festival recording that you're about to hear was brought to you with funding from a copyright licensing New Zealand grant and with the support of ORFM. This session, Murder with McIlvanny, featuring Liam McIlvanny, was chaired by Steve Braunius. Enjoy. Uh, hello everybody, uh, thank you for that warm welcome uh, and thanks for coming to this session of the uh, At the Dunedin Writers' Festival. Uh, my name is Steve Braunius, I'm with Liam McIlvanny and Liam will be available to sign copies of his latest excellent crime novel uh, outside at the UBS store, just outside the auditorium. Uh, just a normal cursory reminder, if you could please turn off your cell phones, that would be great. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to sit with Liam for this next hour and talk about death and terror and violent murder. <laughs> Uh, Liam is the Professor of Scottish Studies at the University of Otago and his latest book, Quaker, is itself an exhibit of Scottish studies. His crime novel is set in Glasgow in 1969. This was a crucial year in the city's history. Glasgow had been known in fond Arcadian terms as the Dear Green Place, but not so in 1969. 850 men were arrested in Glasgow that year for possession of an offensive weapon, mostly knives and razors, but also swords and hatchets. The city's vital statistics could be measured in infant mortality, infant mortality alcoholism and slums. And it was in that setting that the city was terrorised by a man who became known as Bible John. Bible John quoted scriptures and raged against adultery and he also raped and killed three women who he met at the Barrowlands Dance Ballroom. Barrowlands is still there with its garish neon sign and the Bible John serial murder inquiry remains unsolved. Liam's novel Quaker takes the Bible John story and runs with it and then he runs away from it as all good and enduring fiction must do to escape the cold tap of facts. He creates a vivid and disturbing story of his own. It's a police procedural featuring Detective Inspector Duncan McCormick. He is a Highlander who speaks Gaelic and he plays something called Shinty and who is tasked to review the unsuccessful police case against the Quaker as Bible John is renamed in this book. But why did they choose McCormick to review this? He specialises in gangland crimes of heists and robberies. Liam thickens the plot by introducing a seemingly random character called Alex Payton, an explosive expert who is lured back to Glasgow to prize jewels from an auctioneer's safe. A nonce is beaten up in a men's toilet and dunked into the urinal. A boy pining for the father who abandoned him discovers a woman's body in a condemned building. A policeman slips into a park at night time to cruise for men. The risks of being, f of being found went even deeper than imprisonment and Liam may or may not know that in 1969 in Glasgow, the Scottish Minorities Group was formed to campaign for homosexual law reform. Throughout this page, throughout this novel, on every page, there's the presence of something seething and rotten, something that draws you in and keeps you there like a captive audience, Glasgow. Quaker is masterful scene setting as well as masterful storytelling, and it was recognised as such last year when it won the 2018 Scottish Crime Fiction Award. And as part of the award ceremony, uh, Liam led a torchlit procession through the streets of Stirling, along with fellow Scottish crime novelist Denise Mina and Val McDermott. So let us now blind Liam with the torchlight of our enthusiasm as I call upon you to give a warm welcome to Liam McIlvanny. Uh, Liam, Bible John without whom you would not have a novel, essentially. Mm. Um, one of the striking things about Bible John is that uh, I believe this was the first case of a police identikit picture. It was, yeah. And he's a very good-looking guy. 
Mm. And I think you write in your novel about some of the older residents of Glasgow feeling quite affectionate towards him mm. because he looks like a throwback to a tidier, more elegant time. Mm. And it would seem to be that he was a very cultured psychopath. Well, we don't know, but that's, that seems to be the, the assumption from the, the evidence that we have, Steve. I mean, he was a, a character that sort of gripped the imagination of the city, um, partly because he, he was so distinctive, he stood out. I mean, it was an, an age when uh, the fashion for men in, in Glasgow was to have long hair. He had short, fair hair. Uh, it was described by the police as having a smart, modern appearance. Um, he was punctiliously polite. Uh, the the uh, sister of the third victim spent an evening in Bible John's company, and he would always he would stand up when a woman came back to the the table, having been to the the ladies' room. Uh, so he he does seem a, a slightly odd candidate for this sort of psychopathic um, serial killer, and he stood out in the context of the Battle Land. The Battle Land was a rough dance hall in the east end of the city, and he seemed much too cultured, really, to, to be in that space. Yeah, I mean, he's very clean-cut, isn't he? Mm. Um, what was he doing there? Was he there to lure victims? Seems to have been. I mean, they were all, the three victims were all picked up at the Barrowland Ballroom and were all taken to within 100 yards of their homes and then raped and, and murdered. And it seemed to be that uh, the barrel land was the only thing that the victims had in common. They all came from different parts of the city. Um, it, there was nothing obvious to tie the victims together apart from the location in which they were picked up. This scene setting, which I talked about before, mm. uh, a few days ago I, look, I, I put into Google Glasgow 1969 and one of the things I found was a, a brilliant sort of uh, photographic a uh, project by a guy who was taking photographs of abandoned tenements. Mm. Uh, was this the kind of source material that you used because it is uncommonly vivid and, and a close setting of Glasgow? It's the star of the book. Right. I mean, Glasgow is fortunate in having been documented at this period by five or six brilliant photographers. So that the, the photographic evidence is, is fabulous. And it's all about the city in ruins, the, the old inner city tenements being demolished and people being decanted to the peripheral housing schemes. And it's got that great sense of voyeurism, just build, it's almost like dolls' houses, these great tenements with the facades hanging off and you can see the wallpaper and you can see people's bathroom suites and you get a sense of, of a voyeuristic insight into, into those lives. So it was... Uh, hmm. Uh, that was part of the attraction, I think, to, to set the book in that particular period, that the, uh, the setting was so evocative. And, of course, Bible John, in a sense, speaks to that period in Glasgow's history. This was the period when, as I say, the, the inner city tenements were being demolished and people were being decanted to the peripheral housing schemes. And although that was a, a positive move in material circumstances you were moving to a situation where you now had an inside toilet and a washing machine. You didn't know who your next door neighbour was. So in the old tenements, you had that sense of community that everyone knew everyone else's business. And it was this that fed the paranoia that anybody could be Bible John. This is one of the great attractions uh, to me of the material, the, the sort of um, fever that gripped the city and the panic that... Uh, your next door neighbour or the guy standing having a pint next to you in the horseshoe bar could turn out to be Bible John. The, the setting reminds me of, um, who was that chap who was sort of almost single-handedly responsible for something we call Scandinavian noir? Henning somebody? Henning Mankell. Yeah, yeah. 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 Does anyone know those books? They were set in Norway, weren't they? Right. And the setting there, is, you know, it just drew you back and drew you back. Why is it that setting seems so important? in crime fiction? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's the old sort of cliche, isn't it, that the, the setting is a character in the book and that uh, for someone like Ian Rank in Edinburgh is a, a crime scene waiting to happen as he puts it in the, <laughs> in the falls. I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think that um, the Scandinavians and people like Ian Rankin writing about Edinburgh have it easy in the sense that, you know, one of the things you're trying to do in a crime novel is 
uncover the hidden underbelly of an apparently respectable society. <laughs> and that's, uh, <laughs> sorry. you know, that's kind of much easier to do in the case of Scandinavia. You've got these slightly dull sort of hygienic social democracies that also surprisingly have this dark underbelly. Or in the case of Edinburgh, you've got this kind of Gene Brodie gentility that Ian Rankin can then uncover. Glasgow's a bit different because Glasgow's kind of in your face. No one's surprised that Glasgow is a violent city. The whole image of Glasgow is predicated mm. on the no mean city, the razor gangs, uh, the highest homicide rate in Western Europe for, for a good number of years. Um, so it's, it's a bit more of a challenge, I think, to write, uh, write crime fiction in, in Glasgow. So it's all underbelly, in other words. What would be the similar... What would be the parallel with Dunedin? <laughs> Ooh, the, the easy questions. Uh, I think that... Got, I mean, Dunedin's got that kind of gothic vibe. Um, I mean, Dunedin, as one of the... One of the plaques on the writer's walk puts it, you know, Dunedin's a place where it's front page headline news if someone has a fire in their wardrobe. You know, nothing happens in, in Dunedin except when something happens. When something happens, it happens. David Bain, Ara Moana. Uh, so you've got that sense of a kind of, uh, the potential for that sort of grand guignol, gothic mm. grotesquerie to, to rise to the surface. Or, indeed, has anyone seen today's paper, the fantastic front-page story about the family in Mosgiel? And the, ro <coughs> the royal family have named their kids, apparently, after this, the children of this family in Mosgiel. <laughs> now, imagine if they turned out to be complete psychopaths. <laughs> that would be a fantastic book. Yeah. Um, the language, too, uh, Liam, in, in your novel, uh, is as important, I think, as, 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 as setting. Uh, you wrote on Twitter uh, a few months ago, I'm writing a scene in which a drunk man is oxted out mm -hmm. of a building and you ask, there is just no English equivalent of oxted, is there? What is oxted? <laughs> so your oxters are your armpits. And oh. so Scots is this great verb where you can be taken by your armpits and huckled out of a, of a <laughs> pub. That might be another verb you're unfamiliar with. Um, yeah, what was that one? Huck, huckled. Huckled? You're, you're huckled by the polis. If you're lifted, well, I, can't, I can't find a verb that you understand. <laughs> if, you're, if you're arrested. Can we have subtitles for this? <laughs> if you're arrested by the police, or as we would say, lifted, you might be huckled out of the establishment <laughs> you're in, or more probably, oxtered. So there we are. And is huckled uh, uh, an, an abdominal reference? Is that of the body? I'm not quite sure what the, the etymology of huckled <laughs> is, Steve, but, but oxtered is definitely. Definitely, yeah. that's your armpits. So. But you do seem to take uh, delight in, in, in Scottish vernacular, I think, in Quaker, is that right? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can overdo that. Um, so I, I try to keep it to a minimum. But you're also, as I've established just now, ambushed at every turn by the first word that comes to you is often a... If it's not an actual Scottish term, it's often a, a Scotticism. You're often ambushed by things that you think are um, standard English that turn out not to be just particular usages. Um, forms will be uplifted or uh, this, this is happening out with normal working hours and people in England and elsewhere look at you as if you're mad. What does out, out with or uplifted mean? So it's sometimes quite difficult to, to try and expunge your prose of that vernacular. I suppose to me my dictionary of the Scottish language mm is in a volume of books, uh, which I used to collect as a kid, and I found one yesterday at, uh, does anyone know Books and Bric-a-Brac in Stafford Street? Fantastic second-hand junk store, bookstore. Anyway, I, I found a copy there of Ur Woolley. Oh, yes. Are you uh -huh. familiar with that? Absolutely, Ur Woolley. So there was an annual, so it's a, a comic strip that appears in the Sunday Post newspaper, which is a newspaper that's not a newspaper. It's full of just random kind of daft anecdotes that you suspect never actually happened. Uh, but it had, for a while it had saturation coverage. Everyone in Scotland read the Sunday Post and they would have these cartoon strips that the Bruins, a family of uh, a sort of a working class kind of matriarch and her, her brood, and Urwali, who was this sort of 
Don Garib, spiky-haired scamp, who would uh, get into various scrapes. And then every year you would get an annual. One year it would be the Urwali annual, and one year it would be the, the Bruins annual. And it was always disappointing the year it was the Bruins. You just wanted more Urwali. The motif of Urwali is that he began and ended every episode by on sitting buckets. on a bucket. Yeah. What, what does that mm-hmm. mean? That was just the... I don't know. Was that something that you did? On. Did you know? Do they I, do I that? I actually sat in an upturned bucket. No, it's not particularly <laughs> Scottish thing, Steve. I don't think. <laughs> um, enough of whimsy for a second. Back to Bible John. I think I've read that you believe that it's most likely uh, a character called Peter Tobin. Do you agree with that? I don't really have a strong opinion about it either way, Steve. That's one of the odd things that people expect once you've spent five years writing about this character that you uh, have a burning interest in, in seeing the case all. I Do you not? Don't, I don't. I've got I don't, no particular interest in whether Peter Tobin is Bible John or, or not. Uh, so Peter Tobin is a, a Scottish serial killer. Um, the, the situation is that they had some DNA from Bible John on a piece of clothing f- that belonged to one of the victims. And although DNA wasn't a thing in 1969 um, they used it to they they actually exhumed a guy in 1996 a guy called John McInnes who they thought was a a candidate to be Bible John and they couldn't get a a DNA Mm. match but then the DNA had degraded to such an extent as I understand it that when Peter Tobin was arrested they couldn't couldn't establish whether it was him or not Do you know what's happened to him? uh, I don't know so the, the case remains open. He's a 79 year old man living Mm -hmm. uh, in prison he got done for uh, again like uh, Bible John uh, murder of three women Mm. Uh, he's in prison he moans all day long apparently and he's hooked up with a cross dressing paedophile I see, Mm. right. So you did not know that There's the the sequel right there isn't it Yeah Yeah, uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's been a, a recent production uh, in Scotland of the Bible John story mm. and what uh, makes it striking is that it's perform- written and performed by women mm. it's an all woman cast and they said a couple of interesting things which I'd like to uh, uh, put to you uh, one of them was that um, uh, they, they, they said in an interview that it's mainly women who are interested in mm. documentaries podcasts and crime fiction about serial killers, and yet, most likely, it's women who are the victims. Mm. What do you think of that? Why would that be? I was actually discussing this with my crime fiction students the the other day, um, because it is a, a familiar trope in crime fiction that you have the, the sort of violated, traumatised body of the female victim, and then the male detectives have all the agency and go off and, and solve the crime. Mm. Um, but yet the genre is I mean increasingly the most successful writers are women and apparently most of the readers of crime fiction are women so we, we were trying to work out what this what this disconnect might, uh, might mean. What kind of ideas were discussed? Well we spoke about um, the sort of shortcomings and pitfalls of um, you know how the female victims are often just used as plot points in crime novels so you've got your dead your dead female victim and then the detectives can go off and and showcase their their virtuosity and they were saying it would be much more interesting if you had a crime novel where you know the the female victim of a rape let's say we we could then follow and you know follow her progress trying to come to terms with or recover from the trauma of the event rather than simply utilizing the Mm. the women as a as a plot point i suppose that was an issue that I had to confront in the, in the Quaker for the first time because my previous two novels, the victims were all male. So this was the first time I had that slightly queasy situation where by, by the nature of the material, you've got your dead female victims and then your male cops. So uh, you're, you're perpetrating old tropes there? Exactly. So I was quite uneasy with that whole, whole scenario. So one of the ways I tried to mitigate that in the book was basically to steal the device used by Alice Siebold in The Lovely Bones and uh, New Zealand novelist Rosetta Allen in Purgatory, uh, novels that are narrated from beyond the grave 
by the, the victims of, of violent crime. So I've got three chapters in the book that are narrated from the point of view of the dead women, which was a, my attempt to give some sense of agency to the, the women, but also to, to try and show that there was a, a hinterland that these women had rich interior lives beyond mm. their appearance as captioned photographs in, in newspapers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a difficult, that's a difficult decision that, mm. that you, you came up with there. Um, a long time ago, uh, I think in the 1980s, does anyone remember a uh, very well-known uh, journalist called Rosemary McLeod, a columnist as well? Uh, a long, long time ago in the 1980s, she wrote a very long feature article in North and South magazine and it was about a woman who had been murdered in the house next door to where Rosemary lived. And uh, she went to visit the, the man who was accused and pleaded guilty of her murder, and she was trying to make sense of it. But what she did in the story, which I found really alarming at the time, is that she wrote quite a bit of it, uh, imagined in the victim's voice. And I remember being struck by this and how kind of ghastly it was and I knew then that there would be the day where I would have to reckon with that and that I might do something similar. Uh, and, you know, didn't consciously put it off, but it was something I was never really attracted to because I found it, um, you know, queasy. Mm. And I did do that last year in a story about a, a poor man uh, who had gone missing suddenly and left his family bereft and looking for answers and he's never been found. And I wrote a, a significant part of that imagining uh, told in his voice. Mm. And I really tussled with the, the morality of that. Can you use a person's life for uh, entertainment purposes, I suppose mm. you could say, or uh, to tell a story? Did you have that with these, Liam? Because I was very conscious yeah. of that Rosemary McLeod story when I read your book. Absolutely, Steve. So, I mean, I wrote the first, I wrote 20,000 words of the book using the real names and using Bible John and trying to stay true to the facts as we, as we know them. Wow. And it, it, it just kind of petered out. It was... Uh, I found myself, I suppose, putting things into the book just because they actually happened rather than because they, you know, made sense in the economy of the, of the kind of narrative or the story I was trying to, to tell. But I was also conscious that the um, children of the original Bible John victims are still alive and, and precisely that sense of here's me writing an entertainment that uh, draws on, on this story. So my first thought was to, there are, as I say, there are three Bible John murders. I thought I'll invent a fictional fourth murder so I can, if you like, draw on the cultural resonance of the first three murders but focus the investigation on the fourth murder. Were you doing this to get yourself off a hook? Yeah, but then I thought, um, I, I had a kind of light bulb moment when I decided that. I thought, actually, you could just make the whole damn thing up. Uh, instead of inventing a fictional fourth murder, let's just make the whole thing up. Let's call it the Quaker. Um, and what a sense of release that was. Suddenly you're in charge of the material instead of the material being in charge of you. And suddenly you can make it up, which is kind of the job. And you also free yourself from the great occupational hazard of the crime writer, which is the email uh, that uh, arrives. Uh, I was enjoying your novel until I read on page 243 that such and such happened, when in fact anyone knows that such and such happened. And you kind of beat your, your head against a, a brick wall at that point. Um, so yeah, it kind of took that whole uh, aspect off the table. I don't know if you have been released, though, because, as I said in my introduction, without Bible John, you would not have a novel. No, anyone who knows the Bible John story would know that this was based on the Bible John story, but I'm not, I was no longer obligated to follow to the letter everything that, that <coughs> happened in the, in the record of the Bible John story as we, as we have it. And it also allowed me to, precisely your point, that trying to ventriloquise real victims of Bible John would have been a step too far for me. Um, but I was able to write from the perspective of the sort of fictional victims. Um, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had stayed 
to the stayed with the the sort of true crime angle. You're following it <coughs> to some letter, though. The setting is still Barrowlands. Yep. Uh, there's the um, detail that the Quaker, like Bible John, seemed to be attracted to, uh, repelled, uh, etc., by the fact that all the th all three women were menstruating. Mm. Uh, so you are, you are, and, and I use the word, I suppose, quite critically, I suppose, you are still using mm. a tragedy. I am, but I'm not, uh, yeah, I mean, from my point of view, looking at the material as a, as a writer, I suppose it was partly a moral question of um, moving away from the, the direct, um, the actual crime. But it was more a technical thing. It was more... Um, I needed to feel in charge of the of the material. And people have written brilliant novels um, using the actual names and, and data. Denise Mine is the long drop, which appeared uh, the year before my uh, novel. It's based on the Peter Manuel killings. Um, she was slightly nod plus to realize that her title had a slightly different connotation <laughs> in, the, in the context <laughs> of New Zealand. Uh, uh, and, and Scotland, of course, it refers to the gallows. Um, but the Peter Manuel killings, that's in Glasgow in the 1950s. That's in the 1950s. Is that right? yeah. Almost like a prequel to Quaker. It is, yeah. So it's, it's partly a question of time, you know, how much time has elapsed. If you think of Walter Scott inventing the historical novel with Waverley, or to 60 years since, you know, is that, is that, is that your time frame? When 60 years has passed, it's fair game for mm. novelists. I mean, Bible John's 50 years, so I haven't quite, quite got there. But it's partly that. Um, would you write a novel um, based on Dun Blaine? No, you wouldn't. Um, partly because it's too close, partly because the subject matter is just too, too horrific. Um, but it's also because Bible John had passed into folklore. It had become almost legendary, although it was obviously a real and horrific series of crimes. It had permeated. It's our, as I've said before, it's our JFK moment. It's the it's the the event that writers in the west of Scotland keep going back to because mm. it seems to say so much about mm. Glasgow and the west of Scotland in that in that particular period. So it was already mythologised. I mean, I, I was born in 1969, mm. the year of the the final Bible John murder, but throughout my childhood, I was always constantly aware of Bible John. Every time, you know, you would open the daily record, every 18 months there would be that identikit, or the artist's impression would be staring out at you. You know, the papers needed an excuse every few months to bring Bible John back because nobody could get enough of that, that story. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to plead guilty to using a real crime for my entertainment, but um, it was also a, a crime that had become the kind of common property of mm. popular culture in the west of Scotland. Mm. In, in, a, in a wider sort of uh, issue, um, this production I was talking about with mm. the all-woman cast uh, devised and performed the Bible John uh, story, they also said in their um, interview uh, that they were concerned with the whole issue in, the, in their production of uh, deriving entertainment from something with the exploitation and victimization of women at its heart. Mm. And I guess we sort of touched on this before, you know. Uh, it is a moral issue, isn't it? It is. And there was, uh, a couple of years ago, you may remember that, that uh, a new prize was launched, the Staunch Prize, uh, by the actor... Um, uh, June McKitchen from Smack the Pony fame. And this is a prize that is awarded to a crime novel that doesn't feature violence against women. Hmm. But the interesting thing uh, was the, the number of women crime writers who were appalled. You know, Val McDermott's line was, I'll stop writing about violence against women when hmm. men stop committing violence against women. So I would tend to... Uh, it's always best to agree with Val McDermott, I think, where, <laughs> wherever possible. But I would tend to agree with Val McDermott that um, rather than simply avoid the subject or pretend it's not happening, the challenge is to try and tackle it with some degree of, of sensitivity. 
So precisely those things, you know, not treating the, the victims simply as plot points, but trying mm. to give the reader a sense of their, uh, the richness of their interior lives. Uh, I think if you can do that, um, you know, it's crime fiction. These moral issues are always going to be uh, in play. You just have to try and handle them to the best of your ability and be um, open to people finding that you didn't or people feeling that you've crossed the line. I'm quite open to it. I'm not requiring everyone who reads the book to agree with, uh, with what I've, I've done. I'm quite relaxed about if people do want to criticise it. Um, you were living back in Scotland for six months last year uh, yep. while the book was out and you were mm -hmm. indeed giving lots of uh, appearances about the book. Yep. Did you, what kind of reaction did you have in Scotland uh, where Bible John is not just a story but as part of the fabric of, of, of history there? I mean, uh, directly did you hear anything from the children of the three women victims? I didn't know. Um, I did have a number of people contact me to say I was working beside a guy in such and such a factory in 1967 and he bought his Bible John. So, <laughs> so that people are still, people still want to solve the case and people are still interested in the identity of Bible John. But nothing, nothing direct from? Nothing directly from any of the relatives of the victims, no. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you had some contact with police officers who worked on, who were working at the time, if not on that particular inquiry. Yes. So I had my cousin is a retired <coughs> retired firearms instructor with Strathclyde Police. Um, he's one of these guys. He joined the force at 17. You do your 30 years. He retired at 47. Sort of a you know, looking for things to do with his time. So for the, for the first two books, the book set in the contemporary period, he was absolutely indispensable. And the, the, the sort of time lapse between the, the UK and New Zealand was fantastic. I would, before I went to my bed, I would, Davy, how would this work? And then I'd get up in the morning and I, I had 3,000 words complete with hyperlinks and <laughs> photographs and, and so on. Um, so he, so Davy put me in touch with two retired Glasgow CID officers who hadn't actually worked the Bible John inquiry, but they worked in Glasgow CID at the time. And so safe to say that these guys rued the day that they uh, let me have their emails because I would sort of persecute them with uh, details of, of procedure. So it's partly, I mean, partly the research is through newspapers and, mm. and books from the time, but it's utterly indispensable to have someone who you can just contact and say, how would this particular thing work and then get it from the, the horse's mouth. I often think uh, when I'm writing or researching uh, true crime stories mm -hmm. and shaping it into some kind of narrative at the end that uh, I ought to be uh, obliging some sort of stronger moral imperative and be doing something to help. That mm -hmm. is, I should quit journalism and enter the police force as a brilliant detective. <laughs> uh, <laughs> These fantasies last approximately mm. three seconds. What about you, uh, Liam? Have you sort of thought, well, you know, perhaps I should do something? No. <laughs> no? I'm an academic narrator, Steve. That's not my job. It's not my business. But why are you interested in crime? Partly because it gives you a strong narrative. You don't have a narrative until something goes wrong. If everything's going <laughs> well for your protagonist bully for your protagonist, but it's disastrous for your story. So, hmm. uh, you know, a, a narrative is something going wrong and then someone trying to put it right. So crime fiction kind of fits that bill quite well. Do you like the idea of finding justice? I mean, um, I don't think it's giving, a, uh, giving things away to say that in Quaker the crime is solved. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, again, that's partly a moral issue, but it's really a an issue of narrative symmetry, that you want that sense of closure at the end, particularly of a, of a crime novel. So, yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm thinking about these issues more from a technical than a, an ethical perspective most mm. of the time. Mm. The, am I right in thinking that the Scottish Crime Fiction Award that you won last year is named after your, uh, your dad? 
Yes, so that was a slightly interesting, uh, the fix is in, Michael Vanny wins the Michael Vanny. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, as soon as they named it, I thought, well, that's, that's me snooker, I'm never going to win that. Uh, so it was a slightly kind of bittersweet experience. Uh, Fergus Barrowman, who's here today, the publisher at VUP, mm. uh, was telling me last night that he had read a number of your father's uh, crime mm. novels. I have not. What are they like, Liam? Uh, oh, I try and avoid uh, reading them, I have to say. Um, I read them intensively as a, as a boy. You did? But, of course, I read them as Roman a Clay. You know, I read, I, I read them to decode them and I knew the characters that were being uh, referred to or parodied in, in some instances. So you can't... I was too close to them to read them as straight novels, if you like. Um, so it has, I mean, it's been quite... Uh, it was quite odd at, the, at Stirling winning that prize and thinking that, you know, in, in some sense... Contemporary Scottish crime fiction begins with a book that was written in our front room at 25 Ellis Street in Kilmarnock, where we weren't allowed to go in because your old man was, was busy working. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's slightly surreal in a way that, uh, mm. uh, you know, you find yourself in, in that position. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're good police procedurals. Um, possibly like me, they're slightly overwritten. Uh, neither of us have been, been shy of a, a passage of purple prose, let's say, in... Uh, <laughs> in our books, and they probably have a, a greater interest in uh, character in depicting Glasgow than in solving the, the crime. They're not really whodunits. So there's possibly elements of, of overlap, but see, I, I kind of try and avoid reading them um, mm. just to, to kind of give me that little bit of distance. The problem in Scotland, I mean, Scotland's, uh, you, as you probably know, one of the great uh, put-downs in Scotland is Oh, him, I can't his father. <laughs> you know, I, I knew his dad. I, you know, he's, he's not all that. Uh, so in my case, of course, that's actually literal. Most people actually did ken my father. So um, it's quite nice to be 12,000 miles away from, from that. You would evidently seem to have some kind of uh, complex uh, feeling or relationship about William. Uh, as you will recall, when he died two, three years ago? Yeah, 2015. 2015, I asked you to write something about him and uh, you very forcefully, forcefully told me to naff off. Mm. Uh, why was that, Liam? I just, um, I took advantage of your own construction. You said, would you like to, to write this or would you prefer to tell me to naff off? Uh, so <laughs> I, I availed myself of that construction and... Uh, uh, no, I mean, I wrote my Uncle Hugh, so the, my father and my Uncle Hugh were the, the kind of brothers grim of uh, Scottish letters. Uh, my, my Uncle Hugh was a sports writer for the London Observer and the Sunday Times. Uh, so he died at the start of the year, and I quite happily wrote 800 words for the Observer on Hughie's death. But I'm not, I'm not doing that for my old man, it's too close. You're not doing it because it's too close, too or close, because you have uh, conflicted feelings about him? Uh, I'm not. I'm not on the couch here, Steve. It's, you know. <laughs> Do you want to lie down? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, it's not uncommon in the west of Scotland for fathers and sons to have a slightly complicated relationship. Let's leave it at that. Whereas uh, Hugh, you were quite close to, weren't you? I was. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Did I tell you that I met uh, your uncle once? He's a, a great hero of mine, Liam's uncle, Hugh McIlvanny. Uh, kind of the dean of uh, football writing in Britain. And I had a project a few years ago uh, when I was there to spend time with and talk to the great football writers of the last 60 years. So Hugh McIlvanny was around about number two on my list and he was a wonderfully charming man and we met at the Savoy. Oh, nice. And, uh, drink, drink would be taken, I'm guessing... Uh, he passed on food. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while we were there, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson, the famous Manchester United mm -hmm. manager, came in and I said, oh, my God, that's uh, Alex Ferguson. And he said, oh, uh, I'll have time for him later. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, nice. he, he gave yeah. no uh, doubt as to who the senior figure was uh -huh. himself. But... Um, yeah. 
you said to me in the green room before about uh, how odd it was that a lot of a lot of weeks your best ri- uh, reading during the week of mm. prose is football writing in the Guardian by Barney Ronay. Mm. Is, is that true? Absolutely. I mean, I kind of read for a living, but uh, I'm often struck by the extent to which, on a week by week basis, some of the best writing I read is sports writing. Um, I don't know what that says. It's maybe just the the need to um, try to capture the fluidity of action that gets writers to raise their game, but uh, mm. particularly doing that, you know, filing right after an event and capturing something of the intensity of that event is a, mm. a skill that I will never have and I'm very envious of. I've never met a deadline in my life, so uh, I'm always envious of people who can write uh, coherently, instantaneously. You've got a deadline at the moment, haven't you, for your next book in this I have, could be a and of series? course I will be meeting that uh, <laughs> deadline. Um, yeah, so the next uh, book is due to be submitted in June, which, as I understand it, is about seven months away. <laughs> so, so, you know. Are you going to build on the, uh, the character uh, in, in Quaker Detective uh, McCormick? Yeah, so I, I wrote the book as a standalone Um, And I finished it rather more conclusively than is the case in the published book. But my editor at HarperCollins, Julia Wisdom, said, oh, I think this this guy could actually come back. So being the the kind of dutiful fellow I am, I, I, Julie, uh, embarked on the sequel. What is Shinty? Shinty is, uh, (laughs) it's a, it's kind of war, really, with uh, a ball and sticks. It's a... I think, I think ice hockey is, is apparently derived from it. It's a, it's a game played in the, mainly in the Scottish Highlands. Uh, hurling would be the Irish equivalent. Um, I've never played it. I've, I've watched it. I've had the misfortune of playing football with people who play shinty and who bring the perspective of the shinty match into a football match, which is not a pleasant experience. And shinty is one often oxted. <laughs> yes, you could you could well if you were poleaxed by a shinty stick, uh, <laughs> or even huckled. Yes, you could be oxed and or huckled. So. <laughs> but no, he's a great character, this uh, McCormick, mm. uh, and the sort of modern tradition, I suppose, uh, where the 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 prime detective is himself or herself. We all remember uh, DC Tennyson yep. and Prime Suspect uh-huh. is a damaged and flawed person. Uh-huh. Would that be true of this character? Yes, uh, I think it's always more interesting to write about damaged and flawed people. Um, I remember with my previous uh, novels, uh, the, my editor at, at Faber, Lee, Lee Braxton, he said, I'm not sure this character is particularly sympathetic. I said, well, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of me in that, in that character, Lee. So <laughs> it's always better, I think, to write about characters who are, who are a, bit, a bit damaged. But it's also, I find it also, particularly if you're writing male characters, Um, It's a good idea to try and give your characters elements of difference from your own Mm. experience so that it's not too close, that you're not just writing autobiography. So I possibly over-egged the pudding in this case in that Duncan McCormick is gay, Highland and Catholic. (laughs) Uh, And I'm I'm none of those things. So it certainly gives me... I've got my work cut out to try and inhabit that character. I thought you dealt with uh, the guy's sexuality in a uh, really discreet and uh, downplayed way where it doesn't Mm. become the emphasis of the novel, but was uh, certainly uh, very shocking and unexpected. And I think Mm. it was at that point that I thought this guy should be in many more books Mm. by you because Mm. that seemed to be something new. I don't know if I've read that before. I don't know. I'm sure it's been done. I'm sure it's been done before. Um, I'd like to pretend that it was uh, a desire to engage with that particular community, but partly it was just that my previous two books had been my protagonist had been um, there'd been quite a lot of domesticity in those books, and uh, I remember Rosemary Goring in the Glasgow Herald saying that he's writing a new form of Scottish masculinity and. When the truth was that I don't get out much because I've got four kids, so I was, <laughs> I was kind of writing what I, what I knew. But um, I thought I've probably done enough of writing about about that sort of domestic environment. 
So the, the standard way in, in crime fiction would be to give your protagonist a, a broken marriage and a drink problem. Mm. Uh, but I thought if you, if you make him gay, that does the same job, doesn't it? It kind of takes that uh, off the table. But also, I mean, I suppose on the one hand, I wanted his sexuality to not to be an issue. He just happens to be gay. But of course, in the context of 1969 and being a police officer, it kind of is a big deal. So it also gave me a sense of the tension between... Um, the character whose job it is to uphold the law, who is at the same time, just by virtue of who he loves, breaking the law. So it, g- it gives you a nice wee tension yeah. there. There was an uncommonly uh, perceptive review uh, of your novel in one of the papers in Scotland where the uh, reviewer talked about uh, McCormick uh, continually trying to sort of look for patterns here and mm. trying to look for meaning to uncover some kind of grid which might help him discover who Bible John Mm. is. And um, the reviewer writes uh, that this desire to manufacture meaning becomes a kind of, this is a word I'd never heard before, apophenia. The psychological condition where connections are seen where there are no connections. What do you think of that? (laughs) That's a new word to me as well. I think I missed that, that review. Um, That's quite clever, though. Well, it's quite yeah, apophenic, I mean, yeah. the novel. He's, I feel, he's yes. always looking for connections. My apophenic not... phase, yes. Yeah. Uh, again, that's just part of the, the genre, Steve, that that's what your, your protagonist is doing. That's what you're doing as a reader. You're trying to you know, absorb the, the relevant data and construct, reconstruct the crime. So as with all crime novels, as Svetan Todorov, the great uh, structuralist, theorist pointed out, there's two stories. There's the story of the mm. investigation that proceeds forward from the murder, and then there's the story of how the murder took place. And the job of the investigator in that first story is to reconstruct the, the other story. So it's just part of the mechanics of the genre, really. Well, one of the mechanics which I found really terrific uh, in the book and in a way, it kind of relates to the way you like uh, football reports, mm. which are very active, mm. is the way that you describe and evoke uh, actions. Uh, you might recall in my introduction, I referred before to a suspect being picked up and dunked in a, uro- in a mm. urinal. How did you do that? Because that was so incredibly realistic. You know, that was really terrific writing. Well, my research involved being dunked in several urinals around the, the city of Glasgow. <laughs> No, um, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't. I, I suppose I like to to try and I enjoy kind of action writing, and I like to leave in uh, passages of dialogue with that. My great problem is, what do people do with their hands when they're talking, or what are your characters doing when they're, they're engaged in dialogue? So I'm quite good at that. Um, you know, Chandler's two people snorting at each other across a desk. You know, you've got your two characters in, mm. in some sort of adversarial dialogue. And I write the dialogue first. And then I think, right, what the hell are these people doing? Uh, and that's when I often invent, you know, they're maybe watching a shinty game or they're playing snooker or they're doing something that allows you to describe action in between. It's basically just filler. It's trying to fill in between dialogue. In some ways, I, I should be writing TV drama and just dispense with the the kind of uh, the dull bits but uh, (laughs) I tend to write the dialogue first and then find ways to try and I suppose uh, you know fill in round about it so I think that's where the kind of interest in action writing comes in Have you thought of writing TV drama? Um, I have Uh, I've actually got a couple of things uh, potentially on the go but uh, nothing that I'm at liberty to speak about just now so that might be something that happens further down the line do you watch TV drama? I do. I watch it quite obsessively on, on Netflix, and you've got to... Um, I mean, we actually we sold the rights to the Quaker to World Productions who make Line of Duty. Um, but in fact, it lapsed last week, so they, haven't, they obviously haven't been able to, to make it. But it is difficult when you're watching, you know, five series of Line of Duty in a, in a row trying to avoid the Adrian Dunbar's character's inflections creeping mm. into your own prose can be quite a challenge. Did you watch the one on uh, New Zealand TV quite recently? Did anyone see this one? Uh, the, what the heck was it called? It was based on those Charlotte uh, Grimshaw novels. What the heck? Bad Seed or something? Did you watch mm. it? Very good. Really? Very good. 
Really? Mm -hmm. A few sort of hands of support? Who, who watched this and thought it was good? Mm -hmm. who, who watched and sort of stank? <laughs> hmm. Did you watch any of that? I didn't know. I missed it completely, but if Philip Temple <coughs> likes it, I'm happy to go along with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, really? So you write the dialogue first? By and large, yeah. You want, the, I mean, essentially you're, the unit of, of a narrative in crime fiction tends to be the interview. You know, your, your detective wants to know something. Hmm. There's somebody who doesn't want to tell them. There's a witness or a potential suspect. And the challenge is for the detective to extract the information that they want. So that's your, that's your basic narrative unit in a crime novel is the sort of adversarial interview. So it's natural for dialogue to be the first thing that mm. comes into shape in that, in that context. And I think you said before that it took you around about six months to write Quaker. Did you say that? Six months? Yeah. Uh, five years. Five years? <laughs> well, I mean, not, not five years. Five years between the publication of wow. the last book and, and this one. There was a good bit of revision and, and various other things going on at the same time. But yeah, which is, which is kind of self-evidently ridiculous. A crime novel every five years is not a thing. <laughs> you know, you literally are not in the game unless you're producing a, a crime novel a year if you're a crime writer. So um, clearly I need to, must try harder on, on that front. It's, it's a long time to be living with a novel. It is. And it was the, I, I had the luxury of not writing it under contract, which I think is, I really enjoyed. Uh, I mean, Part of the problem I'm having now is that the book I'm, I'm, I'm in, this is the second book of a two book deal that I'm completing just now. And there is a bit of, I've got to finish this contract. Hmm. Whereas if you're writing a book out of contract, nobody's waiting for it. Nobody gives a shit if it arrives or not. And then you've got the, the uh, luxury of a finished product to take to market. Do you want this book or not? You're not saying do you want four chapters and a synopsis. Hmm. There's the book, do you like it or don't you? So you're in a much stronger position um, in all sorts of ways. What can you say, without giving too much away, uh, in fact, you may only want to give a very little bit away, but about the next book, which you had nominally called The, the civilian, civilian, but I think you're changing that? Well, I don't know. I'm kind of, I, I can never get titles. The idea is to get a title before you begin, and then hmm. everything resonates, sort of play off it throughout the book. I've never managed to get a title uh, in advance of, uh, of a book. In fact, I submitted The Quaker to HarperCollins under the title The Clearance, which I thought was quite cute. It was the... What word? The Clearance. So the Highland Clearances, the, the tenements being knocked down, the clearance rate for the detective and so on. The Clearance? The Clearance. That's a yeah. terrible title. Well, that's, that, was the, <laughs> that, that was the view of my editor who said uh, <laughs> we had this wee sort of three-way... Um, sort of bidding process for the book and when they got it the editor said great we're delighted to have your book it's called The Quaker <laughs> okay yes you're, you're probably right um, so this next one is a, a sequel it's uh, Duncan McCormick uh, it goes down to the, the Met in London at the end of The Quaker but he's actually back so it's 1975 he's had a spell in London ah. and he's back in Glasgow for this next one what's the crime? Uh, God it's a bit complicated. There are various uh, there are various crimes on the go. Um, I'm not sure I could actually answer that question myself. Steve, Is it be, a violent crime? Uh, some of the crimes he looks at are, are violent. Yes. Well, I mightily look forward to that. I think it's a terrific book, Quaker. Really, uh, really first class. That's and nice. I would like to open uh, questions to the audience here. Uh, we have Nikki, who's going to be roaming around with a microphone to pick you up. But yeah, I'd be very interested to see if there's anyone who does have a, a, a query or two of uh, our man, Liam, here about uh, Glasgow, Scotland, crime fiction, football, his terrible titles, uh, <laughs> anything at all. We have one on the front row from <coughs> Samantha. You would have, um, if you think you would have been a writer if your father hadn't also? Um... That's a sort of impossible question to, to answer, really. Um, I, but my wife there knows what's going through my, my head. Uh, you know, if, if your granny had balls, she'd be your grandpa. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's just a sort of completely counterfactual scenario that I can't really. Um, I've spent my whole life reading, writing, being engaged in books, and being surrounded by books. Pretty difficult for me to think of, uh, you know, a situation where that wasn't the case. So I've no idea. I'm sorry. Uh, Kingsley Amos famously never read a goddamn sentence of his son uh, Martin. Yeah. What did uh, was William a fan of yours? Did he read you? I don't know. I think he read the first one, and uh, I think he thought it was okay. Uh, but we never spoke about uh, anything else. I never showed him any of the material before I published it which might have been slightly short-sighted um, in terms of trying to avail yourself of his expertise, but uh, there we are. It wasn't a, a subject? No, we kind of talked about football and politics. We didn't really um, talk about our, our writing too, too much. Um, another query? There's uh, a chap over here, Nicky. Hi, Liam. So you're, you're a Scottish writer living in New Zealand, yes. writing Scottish crime fiction. Yep. What do you think the landscape is for New Zealand crime fiction? I mean, no Marsh has been dead a long time. Um, do you know if there's any sort of up-and-coming? Would you consider writing a New Zealand crime? Well, there's a lot of great New Zealand crime fiction being written. Um, we actually have our own Dunedin Detection Club that meets uh, in the Albar pub uh, every month for a pint with people like Paddy Richardson and Vanda Simon and Finn Bell and uh, Karen Trebleco. So there's a real cohort of crime writers even in, in Dunedin. Some like Paul Cleave um, absolutely kills it uh, in the magical land of overseas. Uh, you know, he sells like 500,000 copies in France and, and Germany, um, even if he's not necessarily um, hugely popular in, in New Zealand. So there's a lot of great New Zealand crime writing um, being written. Uh, Vanda Simon currently is in the UK promoting her uh, Sam Shepard novels, two of which have been published by Orenda in the UK, and she's going down an absolute storm. She's really uh, generating a lot of enthusiasm in the, in the UK. Um, would I write a New Zealand crime novel? I've started one, hmm. um, but I've put it aside, uh, so I, I may go back to it. It's, I hope to write a New Zealand crime novel at, at some stage. Where is it set? Set in Dunedin, inevitably. Uh, my edit I, I changed the editor... Uh, between books two and three, and my previous editor was a great kind of old school London editor, Derek Johns at AP Watt, the oldest literary agency in the English speaking world. Uh, you're writing a novel set in New Zealand, son. What are, what are you thinking? Who wants to buy that? Um, so that was, that was very much the view from literary London, but whether the success of Eleanor Catton in the interim will have changed the, the game, I'm, I'm not sure. But I think I'll, I'll do one at some stage. Uh, got time for uh, one more. There's a chap over there, Nicky. Yeah. In your novel, uh, Where Dead Men Go, was it also based on real people? And also, I take it from that, you're a Rangers supporter. Is that right? <laughs> oh, this, this was going quite well till the... Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a Kilmarnock supporter. Uh, in fact, I went back for six months. So Kilmarnock uh, last won the league in 1965... But they were actually the last town team to win the league, apart from Aberdeen. You bet you're sorry you asked this. Apart from Aberdeen twice and the United once, it's, it's been Rangers and Celtic since 1965. Uh, we also, if you've been watching the great European comebacks in recent days, they're kind of meh from a Kilmarnock point of view because we, were, we went out to Germany to play Eintracht Frankfurt, got beat 3-0, lost a goal in the opening minute of the return leg, 4-0 down, and came back to win 5-4 and go through. So Liverpool and Spurs have got nothing on Kilmarnock. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> or was it based on... I, I don't... Off the top of my head... I mean, listen, once I've written a book, I can't actually remember what's in it. So off the top of my head, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, no, that, they would, so the gangster yeah. characters would be, would be based on a kind of amalgam of sort of Glasgow gangsters... At the time, so they would they would perhaps be based on loosely on actually existing uh, people, but there wasn't. I don't think the scenario was uh, based on on real life. The session is being recorded, so Liam is being immortalised here as a football tragic. There we are. <laughs> um, 
I'd like to thank everybody for coming along to this session at the Dunedin Writers' Festival with Liam McIlvanny, the author of his new crime novel, Quaker. Uh, as I said before, it really is first rate. It's a fantastic read. It's very grim. Uh, you feel as though you are unfortunately living in Glasgow in 1969, and it's not a particularly pleasant place that somebody any second might come and swipe your head with a pint of heavy. Mm. Is that how I pronounce it? That's how you pronounce it, yes. Heavy. That's, that's fine. Can I say just before we go on, it's a complete delight and privilege for me to be interviewed by someone who I regard as one of the finest pro stylists in this country. So it's been a great pleasure Thank for you, me Liam. to have that. A touching way to finish. Um, <laughs> I'm also available to sign many books. <laughs> no, uh, thanks so much again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give Liam McIlvanny a warm hand. This Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival recording was brought to you with funding from a copyright licensing New Zealand grant and with the support of ORFM. The festival receives help from many corners, but we'd like to give special thanks to our major funders, Creative New Zealand, the Dunedin City Council, the Otago Community Trust and the Lion Foundation. Mm -hmm.